Welcome back, everyone. I hope you're here once again, full of energies for our afternoon. We're now moving to the fourth and final panel of the day on what the current state aid rules deliver and what they don't. The panel will be moderated by Celine Gauer, who is the Director General of the Commission's Recovery and Resilience Task Force. In her illustrious career with, uh, within uh, the Commission, Celine has also served as Director for Energy and Environment in DG Competition. As panelists, we have uh, with us uh, Matthias Buck. He's Head of European Energy Policy ag at Agora Energiewende, where he directs its energy policy work in several European countries. Prior to this, Matthias was also in the European Commission, including in DG Energy and in the cabinet of the Commissioner for Environment. A published author, he was also co-founder and editor of the Journal for European Environmental and Planning Law. Susanna Kingston is Professor of Law at University College of Dublin and a senior counsellor practising at the Irish Bar, specialising in EU law. Significant publications include Greening EU Competition Law and Policy and European Environmental Law. Natalia Fabra is Professor of Economics at Universidad Carlos III de Madrid and is Researcher Fellow at the Centre for Economic Policy Research at the University of Cambridge Energy Policy Research Group. And she's also Associate Member of the Toulouse School of Economics. She is a member of the Commission's Economic Advisory Group on Competition Policy. Natalia works in the field of industrial organization with emphasis in energy and environmental economics and regulation and competition policy. Finally, we have with us Luminitsa Obudescu. She is the permanent representative of Romania to the European Union following a distinguished career as a civil servant. Promoted to the rank of ambassador in December 2014, she has also served as state councillor at the Prime Minister's Chancellery. And she has also been advisor to the Prime Minister on EU and foreign policy. Luminitsa has a PhD in international economic relations. And now, Celine, over to you. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm very honoured and very happy to moderate this uh, very nice panel on, the, on a key question as a state aid, uh, state aid control, the role of state aid in the context of the Green Deal. What can state aid do and when, what can it do? To start the discussion, I think what the question we would like to, 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 to dive a bit into, into more is whether state aid is actually the right instrument to promote the objectives of the Green Deal. Based on the submissions that we have received in preparing this conference, we, we see that we have very different take on this question. Some of the respondents considered that state aid and uh, Green Deal are essentially two completely different things and we should leave to environmental law the protection of environmental goals and uh, only have state aid dealing with, uh, with economics and access to public financing. Some others consider that state aid is really the key tool to enforce uh, efficiently uh, environmental goal and that no state aid should ever be allowed uh, if it contravenes to the objective of the Green Deal. So what I would really like to ask our panelists this afternoon is what do they think? Where do they stand in that uh, very lively debate? And let me maybe start with, uh, with, with Natalia. Natalia, also looking back uh, at, uh, at the decisions that have been taken in the last, in the last years, uh, how do you see the role of state aid? Does, does state aid really deliver on the Green Deal or not? I'm afraid you're muted, Natalia. We don't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry about that. Thank you, Celine. Let me start by congratulating the DigiCon for organizing this conference, which, is, which has been uh, great so far and for opening up the debate. I have to say that I align myself with the second view that you just described. I think that a state uh, aid control must play a fundamental role in the energy transition. Indeed, most of the Green Deal investments uh, will require a state aid from a uh, um, energy efficiency investments to uh, sustainable mobility, to name just two of these uh, examples. Uh, there's going to be a massive amount of funds that are going to be invested, which is also an additional reason why we have to make sure that we get it uh, 
we get this right. Uh, and in my view, uh, the best uh, way to allocate uh, scarce resources, let's not forget that public funds are limited and therefore uh, they are costly, is to rely on competitive uh, mechanisms. And I believe that for this matter, state control has demonstrated uh, to be uh, very effective. And this has been mentioned in the conference so far. One of the success stories of state control in Europe, I believe, has been the fact that uh, the current guidelines have established uh, the use of auctions as the default mechanism for procuring uh, renewables uh, in Europe. We have seen that uh, renewable options uh, have allowed consumers to benefit uh, from competition. We know that uh, uh, one of the major benefits of competition is that it pushes uh, firms to compete so as to drive uh, prices down to marginal cost, and it pushes them to innovate so as to be able to uh, reduce uh, those costs. Uh, just as a matter of an example, uh, last week in Spain, we had one of the most recent renewable auctions, uh, and uh, we have seen that uh, competition among investors has driven down the prices that the Spanish consumers are going to be paying for these new solar and wind investments at price around 25 euro per megawatt hour, which is certainly below the current uh, prices that we are seeing in the uh, wholesale electricity market. So I think a state date. Uh, uh, rules can have a major role to play as a rule book for this energy transition. Uh, but if we are going to rely on these rules, it's very important that we get this right. And I think that uh, this is a critical moment, uh, given that, as has also been mentioned during this conference, uh, you are currently uh, revising uh, the, the guidelines. And whereas I am very positive about many of the aspects of the, of the current uh, rules, there is one that I believe has been overemphasized, which is uh, the requirement of using technology-neutral uh, mechanisms. Uh, we know that technology neutrality is good at picking the least cost uh, uh, investors, if we leave aside, of course, uh, some externalities such as learning by doing externalities. But we also know, even though in my view this has not been sufficiently emphasized uh, in practice, that technology neutrality can give rise uh, to overcompensation. So somehow when we are deciding on whether we should have technology neutrality as a requirement or not, we are faced with this trade-off between uh, leaving excessive rents uh, to some of the investors versus achieving uh, efficient uh, outcomes. I've been doing some research on this matter with uh, Juan Pablo Montero, and we have uh, come to the conclusion that when we put to compete, things are very different with different uh, cost structure. Uh, uh, using or relying on technology neutrality might give rise to excessive rents. And let me again remind that public funds are are costly. So we are when we are giving away excessive rents to firms, uh, we are not using those resources uh, for more uh, productive. Uh, purposes. Uh, so this is not to say that we should not be uh, using technology neutrality or that we should always uh, be using it. Uh, rather, our, our view is that this should be decided on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, basis, uh, meaning that it should not uh, be part of the requirements of the state aid uh, rules. So uh, in a nutshell, I believe that state aid rules can be a very powerful uh, tool to foster the use of of competitive mechanisms, uh, and this can be very, very important for the energy transition, not just for, for procuring renewables, but also many other uh, low carbon investments, but we have to uh, get uh, the rules uh, uh, right. Let me conclude by also uh, saying a, a bit about uh, green conditionality. Um, I wish the state aid rules could come with some sort of, of green conditionality. I find it somehow contradictory that Europe is leading the way in putting forward very ambitious environmental targets, but on the other hand, it is allowing its member states to give grants, to, to grant aid to activities uh, that might uh, be damaging uh, the environment. So, so the, the rationale of, of a state aid control is to uh, stop member states uh, from giving aid to uh, activities that uh, could have inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the form of distortions to competition and distortions to trade. Well, I believe that damaging the environment is also a major inefficiency that we are trying to avoid. And therefore, I, I wish that the no harm principle that uh, Timmermans uh, mentioned at the very beginning of the conference could be part of this uh, uh, rule book, uh, uh, because I think that would be a very valuable uh, addition of, of, of a state aid. I understand that the recent decision by the European Court of Justice on, on Hingy Point uh, C could make this uh, case more difficult, but I wish the 
the Commission could really rely on all the provisions of the uh, Treaty on Environmental Protection to make sure that no state aid is given uh, to activities that damage uh, the, the environment. Maybe uh, legal scholars uh, would argue that uh, this is not currently possible uh, under the current state's rules. If that was the case, then my understanding as an economist is that uh, we are missing an instrument, and maybe uh, that instrument should rather come uh, through regulation. I think competition policy enhances uh, climate policy, uh, but it also enhances regulation when regulation is right and it's uh, really playing its role. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Natalia. And before we ask Susan for her views on the, on the legal possibilities of, of having such a requirement, let me turn to, to Matthias. Matthias, how far should we go in greening uh, competition policy? Uh, should we really have the do no significant harm principle as a condition uh, for allowing state aid? Um, thank you. First, thanks for being invited to this conference. I think it's very timely and very important to have this debate. And uh, before we um, embark on an update of the state aid framework for Europe. Now, my starting point, our starting point as Agora is um, looking at what climate neutrality actually means and taking it seriously. From that perspective, it is very clear um, that as um, Natalia was saying, state aid must take the Green Deal and climate objectives as a firm reference point in all assessments, not only on environmental aid, but really across the board. Why? Because many of the investments which are happening today actually have lifetimes that reach well beyond 2050. So unless they are consistent already today or in the next few years with our climate neutrality objective, it will not be possible for Europe as a continent to become climate neutral by 2050. Just to give an example, gas infrastructure has lifetimes of 60 years and beyond. Some industry investments also reach that uh, time frame. So it is very important really today already to have this long-term perspective in mind. And this must mean that we are also taking it into account in context of state aid. Um, now, how to get there? And Celine, this, I think this was your question. Um, in our view, we need a specific assessment that becomes part of the routine state aid assessment done by the Commission. Um, the do no significant harm principle is a good starting point in that regard. It will set out minimum standards for labor rights, human rights, uh, environment. Um, but of course, the European Union as such has become very concrete in what it wants to achieve on climate and the Green Deal. And uh, we believe that it must be, um, these very concrete targets must become part of the debate also on state aid. Of course, the, uh, it was already mentioned, the European Court of Justice in the Hinckley point case had explicitly said that uh, compliance with EU environmental laws is a firm reference point also for the legality of state aid. In addition, when it comes to the assessment of the conformity with the climate and energy um, objectives of the Union, we believe there needs to be a balancing test between the public policy objectives, which are not the climate and energy ones, and the climate and energy objectives that we have set ourselves. Set and up. where a project clearly is moving into the wrong direction, there need to be some mitigating measures taken to ensure that it is not um, harming our objectives or possibly um, becoming a stranded asset in the future. Thank you very much, Matthias. Before we, we hand over to, to Suzanne to tell us what legally is, uh, is actually uh, possible, I would like to get a more well, member like state to get a perspective from, uh, from this. And, and Ruminitsa, could you tell us, in, in your member state shoes, how, uh, how do you make this trade-off between the economic interests that, you, that you're trying to promote and the economic uh, development that you're, that you're trying to achieve with the state aid and uh, the environmental goals that you are pursuing? Thank you, uh, Celine, and many thanks for the invitation and congratulations for the initiative to organize this discussion, uh, which is uh, very important and very timely. So we, uh, the EU and the member states, uh, have we, we have clear, clear objectives in terms of uh, reaching uh, our green targets, our digital uh, targets, our resilience uh, targets. 
Of course, we have the financial resources, the next generation, the EU budget, the national budget. We have different instruments, uh, and uh, of course, competition, state aid is one of them. But we also have different uh, realities, uh, um, different starting points, different structure of the economies, uh, different energy mix, uh, um, and uh, different access to, to finance. So it is the case of, of my country, of Romania, which is very, very supportive of reaching uh, the objectives in terms of uh, climate, uh, green or, or digital. So in order to meet, uh, to meet uh, our joint uh, objectives, uh, and which is not uh, a process per se, you know, um, I think um, um, we, we have to use all the instruments. And the question for us is how we can adapt the, the competition policy in order to be fit for green, or even for digital, how the competition policy can also take into consideration this different uh, situation, these different uh, realities in the member states. And for us, the, the key word here in all the process is transition or this gradual approach, I would say. Of course, with the support of the, of the European uh, Commission. Very much in line with what uh, the previous speakers underlined, of course, the, the state aid policy has the uh, potential to make a significant contribution in achieving the long-term objective of the European uh, Green Deal and achieve, uh, achieving the goal of climate neutrality uh, will re require major, major changes in all, all areas to a coherent uh, state aid policy. Um, this necessary trans, trans, uh, transformation can be can be guided and even more can be sustained. Um, in our view, um, an adaptation of both state aid policy and uh, state aid legislation is needed to ensure a transition that can be uh, supported by all the member states, so that no one is uh, is uh, left behind. This involves adapting existing state aid instruments with aid intensity at the highest possible level in order to increase the incentive effect. And the state aid rules should also ensure greater flexibility, and I underline this word flexibility, and be a future proof as to foster the transition to a climate neutral economy. And here I have a concrete uh, example, uh, and I just want to, to, to mention one uh, common uh, initiative of five member states uh, from our region, Romania included, uh, to, to the Commission, um, uh, we asked the Commission for the introduction, introduction of specific provision directly governing state aid issue within the Just, just Transition uh, um, Fund framework. So we, uh, we ask the Commission to explore the possibility to increase by 15% of aid intensity areas covered by uh, Just Transition Fund and the by by uh, by the transition just transition mechanism combined with an increase of the notification thresholds for a project supported by the gtf and uh, we are we are glad to see that uh, a commission uh, positively um, answer uh, to to our our demarche so i have a lot of concrete examples uh, also uh, relate mainly related to energy uh, sectors for instance uh, uh, in the in the case of the heating sector, uh, I can uh, I can develop a little bit here where where we see uh, necessary to introduce a realistic transition period until which the central heater system sh could uh, become more efficient. Uh, time timelines which must be uh, adapted to the realities uh, of each member state. Uh, at the same time, in, play, in applying the, the state aid rules, uh, the natural monopoly character of the distribution network should be also taken into account, as well as the fact in certain member states they are a service of general economic interest purposes. So they are concrete uh, example. Uh, and I think uh, to conclude my 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 remarks, yes, uh, we need we need a competition policy uh, fit for green. But also we need the uh, instruments to, to support this transition uh, process in, in the member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luminitsa. Oh, sure.
Matthias, you, you mentioned a balancing test that we would need to that we would need to undertake before we can authorize uh, a state aid measure. Uh, how would you do that in practice? So what would you balance, and 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 how would you uh, would you measure finally different things that are of different nature against each other? Okay, sorry, I had difficulty okay, sorry, with my sound. I difficulty with my. Sound. I have a very strong echo. I have a very strong echo. So, so, so on the balancing test. So on the balancing test. I think there are, uh, I think there are uh, two essentially big categories. Two One, big is, categories. Uh, One is uh, projects and activities, projects and activities which clearly qualify from, from a green deal perspective. I think what the Commission has um, what the Commission has put out these um, flagship projects, so um, power up flagship. Uh, targeting the call to clean uh, transition, call to clean transition um, flagships focusing, um, on, building flagships focusing on building renovation, on, um, on district heating systems, etc. This is the right approach across uh, focusing very much on focusing um, large scale transformative investments, uh, which clearly move into the right direction. I think um, for those types of projects, it's essential for member states to be very clear that there will be a fast assessment of the state at compatibility and very little effort to get this done. So I think what our Romanian, what the Romanian ambassador just said, I think really uh, needs to be um, taken seriously there by the Commission to speed this up as much as possible. Now, there are other types of um, activities and projects which would raise questions. And I think, uh, or we believe that the Commission should do, let's say, a prima, a prima facie screening what types of what nature of project are we dealing with is there an expectation of very high um, emissions from such activity um, what is the lifetime of such an investment does it actually uh, reach for two or three decades uh, the lifetime and then it should um, be assessed more in detail and if um, it is not an, a climate um, or energy transition related project, but something else pursuing uh, objectives like employment, um, securing jobs or creating uh, new jobs, which is of course uh, critical now in coming out of the crisis, um, then it will be necessary to balance um, those objectives. Of course, um, let's take the example of um, the um, support given to Air France by the French government. I think it's a good example where um, there is an immediate need by the airline to keep operating and to keep um, people in employment, its staff in employment. At the same time, there's a very clear challenge to transition to lower emissions from um, air transport. And the French government has given, let's say, a package support to Air France, helping to keep people in employment at the same time um, pushing Air France to look into alternatives for inland flights and to develop a strategy for greening the fuel it is using so to reduce future emissions. I think this is exactly the right approach that should be taken also for other types of projects um, which are not as such uh, contributing to climate protection. So to mitigate some of the effects and to really push to um, come on the climate um, protection consistent pathway. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, turning now to Susan, how does it square legally? Does it? Uh, uh, no, I see that Susan has uh, has uh, connection issues and and couldn't um, couldn't join. Uh, so I hope we'll get her later to to see whether uh, there, there are any legal considerations to to apply to this very very uh, green uh, green approach. Uh, then uh, let me pick one of the questions from the from, from the audience that was uh, that was addressed to, to Luminitsa. Um, you ask for more flexibility uh, from uh, from stated rules, but we never see negative decisions. So, do you have examples of desirable investments that would have been blocked uh, by stated rules? Yes, well, um, I, we have some uh, some example of this, uh, and we have, uh, in fact, uh, uh, also a good cooperation with the Commission. I have to underline, 
but this is, uh, for instance, uh, um, I have concrete, uh, concrete, uh, a lot of concrete issues, uh, and where we have to, to, for for instance, I can give you more more details. For instance, uh, the current general block exception regulations on on this. Uh, 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 for us, it is essential that it provides uh, with a comprehensive legal uh, framework to support this uh, GTF funded projects, uh, as well as other complementary funded projects, uh, for reason of, of efficiency of, of uh, coher uh, coherence as well. Uh, with regards to the new regional aid guidelines, uh, the state uh, aid guidelines for environment and energy, or the state aid framework for research, development, and innovation. Here, I think, uh, in our views, and um, or also I would say in my capital's views, it's a, uh, we need a simplify uh, uh, analysis of the proce procedure for the the GTF, for instance. Why I'm in, I, I'm uh, underlying very much this issue with respect to the GTF. It's linked also with the structure of uh, economy. Romania still has a very important mining sector, and of course, uh, and also. Um, a gas uh, uh, an, an energy mix based on mining on coal but also on on gas so in order to reach our objective and we as i mentioned at the beginning we are very very much supportive of this objective but we are linked with this, our structure of economy and our structure of the energy mix and we cannot do it off of of uh, over the night we need this flexibility when we are discussing these concrete projects, and it's also linked with the fact that, of course, we have budgetary constraints as well. So this is the way, uh, the way, concrete way, my capital uh, uh, sees uh, the, 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 all the discussions we have now with all the instruments and the role of the competition policy and or, or the role of the state uh, state aid. So how this and this is a very pertinent uh, question for all of us. How for uh, member states who uh, wants to, 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 to reach uh, the, the target in terms, in terms of uh, environment and climate target, uh, how can we use in an efficient and flexible way the, the, all the instruments, the state and the competition, in order to, to do it, but we cannot do it over the night. So this is a question, of course, not only for the Commission, but also for, for, for uh, my colleagues here in the, in the panel. So being wa wanted to, we really want to and support the, support the objective. And, uh, but the, this is the reality, as I mentioned, this is the real reality in, in not only Romania, but in a lot of member states. Thank you very much, uh, Luminitsa. I think you, you referred to the possibility of having kind of premium for uh, for some uh, for some type of, uh, of of measures that would go in the right direction for 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 greening. Uh, so that 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 rings a bell for as green bonuses that have been also very much discussed in the in in the consultation uh, prior to this uh, to this event. And Natalia, you were talking earlier about risk of overcompensation. So how would you square the two? How would you reconcile green bonuses and the promotion of, uh, of, of, of green measures uh, with uh, the absolute need not to have overcompensation uh, under stated rules? Yeah, uh, I think overcompensation is, is a problem that uh, spreads across all areas of, 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 of stated control. And it's something that we certainly uh, need to avoid with, uh, with the proper rules. Um, regarding the green bonus, um, it's true that a state aid already uh, gives those provisions in order to promote uh, certain activities that uh, need a state funds uh, to be promoted. Uh, so, so it's true that it's, it's good to have uh, the stick and the carrot, and the green bonus can be that carrot that uh, might enable uh, member states to give more aid to those activities that really uh, contribute to the Green Deal. I'm not fully sure, I have to confess, uh, whether that is not already something that is already embodied in the current uh, state of rules. Regarding the discussion that uh, you were just uh, having regarding the flexibility of state aid rules, I, I have to say that I'm concerned about uh, confusing flexibility with a weakening of a state aid uh, control. Um, I don't think a state aid control needs to be weakened. It has to be enforced uh, with the right tools. And I don't think there's a contradiction between uh, industrial policy or taking into account the asymmetries between member states and a proper enforcement of a state aid control. On the contrary, I think that uh, uh, we all agree that the just transition fund is necessary whenever there's a change and certainly 
the energy transition is a big change in our societies. We know there is winners and losers, and we know that we don't want to leave uh, anyone behind. Well, I, I think that a state aid control can help us achieve that goal. For instance, if there's a region uh, where coal plants are going to be phased out or gas plants are going to be phased out, well, maybe we can uh, use a state aid uh, with the right uh, rules in order to promote uh, more sustainable activities within those areas so as not to have increasing unemployment rates and also so as not to have uh, the reaction uh, by the citizens. It's not just a matter of, of social justice, but also we want to have everybody on board and we don't want citizens to oppose those uh, changes. I think a state aid can be a very powerful tool to make sure that the transition uh, is just. In those cases, we will not be talking about overcompensation. I think uh, that compensation, not necessarily direct, but rather in the form of new types of sustainable investments, is totally and should be totally in line uh, with both the spirit of the Green Deal and the spirit of the estate aid. Thank you very much, Natalia. I see now that, uh, that Susan has managed to, to, to join us. So Susan, uh, as, as you could uh, hear from the, from the different panelists, there's lots of support for having uh, green considerations really embedded in, uh, in, in state aid control and, and state aid used as a tool uh, to achieve the European Green Deal uh, objectives. So is it legally possible after Hinckley? After Hinckley? Thank you, Celine. Can I just check you can hear me? I can. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the technical issues I'm having at the end and i um, very grateful for the chance uh, to intervene. Um, yes, just following on what's, from what being said, um, I mean, it's very clear, I think, that um, state aid indeed plays a pivotal role in realisation of the Green Deal, of course. And we've heard from Executive Vice President Timmermans um, earlier on that if we look back in 20 years, we will see this is one of the most transformational periods in human history. And I think state aid rules uh, offer a huge opportunity to implement the new economic model underpinning the Green Deal. That simply, in my view, cannot be missed and, and must be seized with both hands, I would argue. Um, and we know that, of course, state aid has already had a head start here compared to the rest of competition policy. We've had environmental state aid guidelines since 2001, and, and these are, of course, under review. Um, and in my view, it's, it's vital that state aid rules provide a clear and certain framework, strong encouraging green innovation, and the Commission has already laid a path for this in the Green Deal Investment Plan. But I would argue that we need to go further than this. Um, and the ele elephant in the room, we've already touched on it, is that state aid for fossil fuel industry, for instance, remains on the basis of the current guidelines entirely compatible with EU law. And the 2014 guidelines expressly do not address the issue of aid to the fossil fuel industry. Um, I know that as a, at a political level, since 2013, the European Council has committed to phasing out this aid. But I, I would argue that we should nevertheless look at the facts. If we look at the 2018 regulation on the governance of the Energy Union and Climate Action, and um, this requires the Commission to put, report each year on member states' progress towards phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. And the Commission's most recent report uh, in October 2020 shows that fact, member states' fossil fuel subsidies are still quite astonishingly gradually increasing overall. And overall fossil fuel subsidies within the EU amounted to 50 billion euros in 2018. I've already been discussing, of course, subsidies to air transport um, earlier today um, at some length. And it must be acknowledged, uh, as Natalia just mentioned, uh, politically this is hugely sensitive. Um, but I think on any objective basis, this state of affairs is, uh, I would argue, impossible to justify. Um, and... The Commission's proposal um, for European climate law uh, is incredibly important in this regard. It sets a binding objective, um, of course it's under review now, um, it's gone to the Council and the European Parliament, but the proposal sets a binding objective of climate neutrality in the EU by 2050 in pursuit of the Paris Goals. Um, and it's impossible 
um, that this could go forward while member states are at the same time subsidising industries that will make attainment of this binding objective impossible. That's at best incoherent, but I would argue also unlawful. Um, we know that a matter, as a matter of law, Article 11 TFEU requires environmental considerations to be taken into account in the implementation of all EU policies. And it's also, this is also now in Article 37 of the Charter. So it really is part of the Union's most fundamental values. Um, and you can see it also in Article 13 TEU, which places an obligation of consistency between policy areas on the Union's institutions. So just briefly, what does this mean for state aid? I would argue it means two things. In the first instance, it means that State aid should not be granted where this would be contrary to EU environmental law. Um, it means, I would argue, that not only environmental benefits, but also environmental costs must be incorporated into the competitive assessment under state aid. And Celine, you brought up the Hinckley Point um, case earlier, and Matthias indeed re referenced it. And I think we're all familiar with it. This was a case where... Um, aid by the UK was authorised by the Commission and then this was challenged before the General Court on a grant, amongst other things, that a new nuclearization doesn't constitute an objective of common interest and that there was a failure to take account of environmental principles like the polluter pay principle and sustainability. And here the Court looked to Article 37 of the Charter and Article 11 TFEU and it held that the state aid which contravenes provisions or general principles of EU law cannot be declared compatible with the internal market. So it held that the proportionary principle, polluter pays principle and principle of sustainability apply. And it went further than that and it said that the Commission had an obligation to check in assessing whether the conditions under Article 73C were satisfied that the activity does not infringe EU law rules on the environment. And then, and this is highly significant, I would argue, it held that if the Commission finds an infringement of those rules, it is obliged to declare the aid incompatible with the internal market without any other form of examination. So the Commission must stop there. It must examine whether there's a breach and it must stop if there's there is no possibility of, of being declared compatible. Um, it is true that there is some tension in the Hinckley judgment. The court also held that in weighing up advantages and an impact on the internal market, there was as such no obligation on the Commission to take into account environmental damage. And the Commission was rather obliged to take into account what the court termed the negative effect this is state aid on competition and trade between member states. But I would argue that this, of course, leaves the door open for the Commission to take environmental costs and benefits into account in the competitive assessment. And that was, of course, not done in the Hinckley case. And, and very importantly, the co judgment confirms that there is a non-intensive standard of review of the Commission's decisions on details of economic assessment. And nothing new, but that's a critical point. The Court looks at whether a proportionality assessment has been carried out, but it doesn't redo the maths for the Commission. Um, and, and, and again, that judgment must be seen in the context of the facts of that case, where we would argue that nuclear power has indeed some environmental benefits, in fact. But fundamentally, I would argue that the Hinckley judgment suggests that the European climate law, when it is passed, will be a game changer. Although, again, we don't know the ultimate exact form it will take. But at present, Article 5.3 of the proposal obliges the Commission to take the necessary measures to ensure that the legally binding objective of, bi of climate neutrality in the Union is attained by 2015 and to eliminate inconsistent Union measures. And I think it's strongly arguable that positive measures of the Commission authorising state aid 
that's inconsistent with that binding climate neutrality objective would be unlawful. And if you look at what's happening uh, in judgments of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, for instance, in the Urgenda case, but also the Supreme Court of Ireland in the Friends of the Irish Environment case, you can see that the courts are giving real teeth to commitments, legal commitments made by states. If you commit, you must, as a matter of law, have to have a credible means of attaining your climate goals, and you must not do things in the meantime that make those impossible to achieve. So just to finish off then, if I may, um, the question is then, how do we achieve this practically? And this is a little bit what Matthias has already been speaking about. And then uh, he was speaking about a balancing test, and I just make some further suggestions in that regard. I think what one option of what we could do is we could impose a mandatory requirement that all state aid notifications must fully address environmental impacts, potential positive and negative. This, in my view, is low-hanging fruit. It's a procedural measure, but it enables impact assessment by the Commission and transparency. Secondly, by moving away from this idea that state aid authorizations must be viewed one-off at a moment in time, rather where state aid is granted with negative environmental effects, this must only be where it's absolutely essential and subject to strict conditions requiring reduction of those effects, that it is an obligation to ensure compliance with EU environmental law and principles, then there must, I would argue, be compliance monitoring and reporting obligations built into all such authorizations. And we can, of course, see the conditionality approach to some extent in the September 2020 um, ETS state aid guidelines. So what about situations where there's genuinely no alternative to keep the lights on in the country at issue? And, and we heard about this from the speaker from the International Energy Agency earlier on. In my view, again, as a lawyer, I think it's useful to approach this by looking at it in terms of burden of proof. If we apply a strict application of the proportionality test on the basis of the evidence that is provided by the state at issue, and we take the environmental costs of the aid into account, we ask ourselves, has it been proven that there is no alternative, less environmentally damaging way of ensuring continuity of energy supply or connectivity of whatever the um, public interest objective is. And if it is the only alternative, then it should be subject as a to strict monitoring and reporting conditions. Just a very uh, final point, and um, to mention the role of civil society in this, this was mentioned by profession, Professor Aguillon earlier on, and I do think it's very important, and I would just mention that the draft findings of the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee from 18th of January this year, where the Compliance Committee held, also arising from Hinckley uh, state aid decision, um, that in fact, the Commission, in granting a state aid decision, constituted a public authority under the Aarhus Convention, um, and the, the Compliance Committee relied on the Hinckley Court of Justice judgment to find that state aid me decisions may intervene environmental law, and therefore um, the uh, Commission and the EU was, in, in its view, failing to provide access to justice in a manner that was contrary to the Aarhus Convention, it, because the ENGO could not challenge the state aid decisions. Um, and then just a final um, uh, other development of note in that regard is the General Court judgment of 27th of January last uh, this year. Um, in the European Investment Bank case. And this was a challenge by Client Earth uh, to the preliminary approval by the European Investment Bank of a loan for construction of biomass power generation uh, plant in Spain. And the question was, could a decision of the board of directors of the EIB constitute an administrative act under the Aarhus regulation? And the general court held that it could, and it adopted a notably broad definition of environmental law in the Aarhus regulation, and held that the EIB had been wrong to reject um, the, the, um, the um, complaint is inadmissible under the Aarhus regulation. So the point is, I think, that the Aarhus regulation is now being given real teeth court and also by the Aarhus Convention Compliance uh, Committee beyond traditional areas of environmental law. And I just finished by asking we, uh, whether we have to seriously question 
why should civil society be effectively excluded from inputting into state aid decisions of pivotal importance for the European economic model and for the Green Deal? And so this, in turn, I think, raises the question whether, in light of the ongoing review of the art regulation, state aid should be included. So I'll just leave you with that remark, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, so we have 15 minutes left, and uh, picking up on uh, on one of the questions from the from the audience, let me let me turn to to the recovery. I think we have uh, a, a huge recovery package uh, that has been agreed by uh, by the European Council last uh, last July, and that will be largely implemented by member states' plan uh, designing investment and uh, and and reform. And 37% uh, of all the expenditure that uh, of, of those plans will have to go to measures in favour of uh, of climate. And all the measures that will be taken will have to comply to the do no significant harm principle. So in that in that framework, state aid control will apply to all the the, the measures that will uh, that will be taken. Turn, let me turn to you to Luminitsa to ask her. So do you see this as a, as as a good thing, as a, as an opportunity to make sure that you will get the most for uh, from the public spending, or do you see that as a as a challenge from a member state's perspective? Luminitsa, please. Uh, many thanks for, for, for the question. I mean, uh, the, the preparation of the national uh, recovery and uh, resilience uh, uh, plan uh, is one of the most complex and uh, difficult exercise I've seen recently. And uh, believe me, it's not only the case of Romania, I think it's the case of all member states. And I am sure that Commission can confirm, uh, confirm it. Uh, we have different challenges. First of all, we have to trans translate this country specific uh, uh, recommendation in uh, tangible reforms. We have to meet our targets, green, digital, so on. Uh, we have to ensure this synergy between uh, the funds uh, under the uh, RRF and the, the cohesion funds. And, uh, and also we have to see how we can support investment in sectors, as uh, you mentioned, energy, district heating, or even digital, in order to, to ensure a smooth uh, transition, uh, leaving no region or sector uh, uh, behind. And uh, I, I must uh, underline that we are really grateful to the European Commission, Celine's team, and other colleagues for all the support we are getting, uh, um, I would say, on a daily basis. Um, I would come uh, up with some concrete, uh, yes, we see this is as, as an opportunity. It is a challenge, but it is an opportunity. And this is a kind of discussion we have uh, home uh, with all, not only with the institution, with the ministries, uh, uh, but also with the private sectors, uh, with, uh, with even with the civil society, in order to explain that uh, in order to meet the targets uh, it is difficult, it's not a burden, and we should should do it, but it should be seen as an opportunity, even if it's difficult, it's difficult because, as I mentioned, we have a, a, a structure of the energy, we have a structure of the economy, and transition is, uh, is quite key. I, I just want to react to one, uh, one issue when we discuss about flexibility. We see the flexibility not in the sense of weakening the rules. It's exactly what Natalie said, Natalia underlined. We have, to, we have to use them in order to support this transition, to support the adaptation, because it's one, it won't be easy for governments. With, including with having this uh, important amount of, of uh, EU funds uh, and the recovery funds, but it won't be easy because you cannot do it over uh, over the night. And there are so social and economic uh, consequences we have to take into consideration. And I have another example of on this flexibility, especially in uh, in the frame of this discussion about uh, um, revision of state aid regime uh, regime. Well, uh, we, we think that the member states envisage to, to, to have a, a significant change in their, in their approach. So just, I mean, if the aid intensity will remain the same, some projects won't be funded because beneficiary will not be willing to provide the necessary much funding from the private or from the, the, from the market sources. So um, the challenge we are facing, it's a double, uh, it's a double one. First, the timing. Uh, fast preparation and implementation because investment have to be functional by, by August uh, 2026. And uh, secondly, as I explained earlier, the funding gap, which in country uh, like Myanmar, like Romania, has a limited uh, response. So 
practically to conclude in uh, to, uh, my, my intervention here, I would dare to say that uh, capital market uh, and its degree um, of uh, development and sophistication does, uh, does make a difference uh, between the member states uh, when it uh, comes to future investment in green and even in digital, um, while acknowledging the respect of fair and equal condition for businesses uh, across uh, so uh, across the Europe. So, of course, for us, one of the questions we have now uh, in our mind is how this could be taken into consideration. So. Uh, in addition to all this issue, you rightly pointed out with respect to the energy sector, we have uh, um, we have this challenge uh, as well, and it's quite uh, quite a serious challenge for for a country um, uh, as uh, as uh, Romania. Thank you. So, turning to Natalia, what do you think? Is that um, what kind of contribution can state aid control do to ensure that the recovery is sustainable? Thank you so much, Celine. Before I think I already emphasized the role that a state aid control can play in promoting the use of competitive mechanisms. And I think it, it would also uh, be providing a very strong value added to the use of the recovery and um, uh, to the recovery funds. Uh, I know that state aid rules apply and we have to make sure they, they do apply. We're going to be allocated a huge amount of funds. Uh, the member states, they're in a rush to spend those funds. Uh, so, therefore, we have to make sure that this trust doesn't imply that they do not uh, comply with the state aid rules, uh, because, if, again, if we use competitive mechanisms wherever possible to allocate these funds, we are going to be able to make uh, more of those, which is particularly relevant uh, given the current uh, need uh, for recovery. Regarding this, I would also like to stress uh, unfortunately, the pandemic came right after uh, the Green Deal was announced in 2019 and in, in Madrid at, at the COP. But I have to say there is a very strong complementarity between the Green Deal and all the funds that are going to come through the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility. And let me just uh, give an example. I believe that these funds are going to facilitate the implementation of measures that go in line with the Green Deal. Uh, suppose that we want to push for carbon pricing, so as to discourage the use of oil and gas and promote the use of, of electricity. Well, it's, it's true that in some uh, uh, cases, and, and the ambassador was mentioning that, there is still many households that are still using uh, uh, heating uh, with oil and gas. Well, you know, if we now have these funds to really promote the substitution of those equipment for more sustainable equipment, then uh, it's more politically feasible to push forward uh, for these uh, tax, uh, green taxes uh, that are really uh, going to foster not a change only in current consumption habits, uh, but also uh, having long-term impacts in terms of uh, promoting the substitution of our current uh, infrastructure and our current uh, equipment. So, so even though we wish the pandemic had not uh, come, I think that uh, having the Green Deal together with the uh, recovery fund uh, is, is extremely uh, complementary and we have to make use of this lever to push for the Green Agenda. Thank you so much, Natalia. Matthias? Okay, so uh, sorry. Uh, so I think uh, picking up on what I said before, I think it would be very important in my view to focus on some of the key transformative investments that the Commission has now called flagships. I think uh, this makes very good sense. And in those uh, contexts, the Commission could also in the state aid context be very forthcoming in helping member states to move those investments forward. Examples on the building renovation. This is one of the main emitting sectors um, and we need to renovate very significantly speed up the renovation rate of the existing building stock and to do deep renovations. There is, if you speak to the stakeholders uh, working on building uh, efficiency improvements, there is an issue with the threshold, the eight intensity thresholds, when it comes to buildings efficiency improvements. This needs to be addressed as a matter of urgency. When uh, there is another cluster around what we would call coal to clean transitions, yeah, like Romania is one of the countries still with a significant share of coal in the mix. And 
looking at the commission data, the commission is in its uh, 2030 assessment, when it uh, was doing the minus 55 impact assessment, if you look at the, the power sector, you only have 2% electricity from coal generation in 2030, according to the Commission assessment. It means we will have an almost complete coal phase out by 2030 all across the European continent. Now, the coal to the maximum extent must be replaced by renewables, and this does need also some flexibility at the moment, and uh, Natalia was mentioning it, there is the issue of technology neutrality. Um, we know the lead technologies when it comes to the coal to clean transition. It's solar PV and it's wind, onshore and offshore. If you go for technology neutral auctions and forcing member states to do technology neutral auctioning of capacity, it is much harder for governments to do the infrastructure planning that is necessary in order for a smooth transition. So this is really something that the Commission should have a second look at how much asking for technology neutrality does make sense. We believe some lead technologies are clear and they need to be scaled as fast as possible in the next few years. Third example is uh, kickstarting investments into climate neutral industry. We know the, there are investments that need to happen. Let's take the steel sector. Um, we need to have according to our numbers, about 40 million tons of steel, primary steel production in Europe should be based on green processes by 2030 in order to have industry contribute to achieving of Europe's climate targets. Now, this will not happen if there is uncertainty on the measures governments can take to support those investments. Because at the moment, looking at the avoided costs of carbon, the um, investment costs are much higher than what the expected ETS price is under the European emissions trading system. So we are talking about um, avoided cost of carbon of 100 to 120 euros per tonne of carbon. And of course, we are not coming near that level, um, even if we have an um, increased ambition in the European emissions trading system to bring it in line with um, 55%. So there, the industry and member states need to have clarity as soon as possible on what are a pragmatic approaches um, to give support to those critical investments that need to happen in the next few years. Thank you very much. And then let me turn for last uh, last minute, last word on uh, from, from Susan. Thanks very much. Um, I, I would just echo what um, Natalia said essentially on this and just what I said earlier about um, the huge opportunity in terms of imposing a kind of conditionality based approach uh, on on the um, on such funds and um, the opportunity then to um, make this complementary in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a wholesale way. Um, so um, that, that I think that just re-emphasizes the, um, the the chance that we have here. Thank you very much, Susan. So thank you very much to very all much, the, the so panelists you for a very uh, lively and uh, and and rich debate on uh, on the role of state aid for for the uh, for delivering on the objective of the of the Green Deal. So I, I, I take it that you all see a massive role uh, for uh, for the for the state aid control uh, to not only uh, give us most green for for our money, uh, but uh, but also to, to to really improve the efficiency of the uh, of this uh, of these policies. So this is. Uh, very good news. I also take that you you see it uh, playing a key role uh, on the uh, on the recovery and on ensuring that the recovery will be will be sustainable. On the on, on the questions that some of you have raised on the the ability of uh, of the Commission to deliver sufficiently quickly the necessary state aid authorization uh, for for those measures that will be part of the of the recovery. I think the, the Commission has taken a very clear commitment and has already provided ample. Uh, detailed guidance for the member states to make sure that state aid is indeed a tool for the recovery and certainly not an obstacle. So thank you very much again for this, uh, this lively debate this afternoon and um, stay safe. Thank you.